All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the very first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the globe through over 40 monthly live, free, interactive broadcasts. Before we dive in with today's presentation, I just want to give a special shout out to our huge audience today. We actually broke the all-time record for most registrations for any program today, so welcome in to the over 320 groups who signed up for today's program from across Canada, the United States, and internationally. I know it's a really odd time for teachers, so we really appreciate you continuing to join us as we celebrate science and exploration around the globe. So, the reason you guys are all here is because today we continue on our Cross Canada virtual road trip in partnership with Parks Canada and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Over the next month, we'll be traveling virtually coast to coast to coast to visit some of Canada's incredible national historic sites, parks, and marine conservation areas. Along the way, we'll be meeting incredible people, exploring some unique ecosystems, and sharing some ongoing conservation projects. If you want to see the full lineup of English language events, you can check out our website here. Uh, I'll leave that up on the screen for the remainder of the intro. So last week, we went out east to Kuchibuguac National Park to hear about river otters and ecological monitoring. It was so much fun, and it's on our YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Today, we are going north. We are going very far north on an adventure together to the Arctic Ocean. So grab your parka, some snowshoes, and a sled, and join us for an adventure like no other to learn about Canada's only national landmark. For this adventure, we'll be heading north on Canada's only road to the Arctic Ocean to answer the important questions, like, what is a pingo? Why are they here? Why do they need protecting? These questions and more will be answered on our Tundra adventure, and you'll get to see how Parks Canada works with the Inu Bialowit and other partners to monitor the coolest polar feature on the landscape. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the delightfully named Kyle Mustard up at Pingo National Landmark to take us away on a really exciting journey. So Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today, man, and take us away. Thank you, Jesse, and Uvlami, and welcome to the Arctic. I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Inuvialuit, about 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in the Northwest Territories. So we were going to broadcast this from outside, but unfortunately, the weather decided to blizzard on us. So we're inside in our studio today. Uh, my name is Kyle, and today we are going to go on an adventure to where the road ends in Canada's north. But before we go, I'm going to get you guys all wherever you are to practice saying good morning in Inuvialuktun, which is the language that people traditionally speak around here. So, can I get everyone to say uvlami? So, uvlami means good morning. So, way to go everyone. Now, come on, grab your coat, some snowshoes, because we're going to head to the Canadian the Pingo Canadian landmark. All right, we made it to the Pingos. But what is a pingo? Well, you're actually looking at pingos. To your left, you've got Ibiak pingo, and to your right, we have split pingo. But what is a pingo, and why is it so important? Well, let's go check one out and find out. Come on, guys. Right, we made it to the top of Split Pingo. And from here, you can see everything. Right out there, you've got the Arctic Ocean. Over there, you've got the tundra. And right behind me, you can see the hamlet of Tuktoyaktuk and the end of the road that goes north in Canada. This road is really important because it is the only road that crosses the Arctic Circle and the only road that goes all the way to the Arctic Ocean. So from here, you can actually take that road and road trip anywhere in Canada. But our nearest city is Whitehorse, and it's that, that way south, and it's about 20 hours drive. So your nearest fast food, your nearest McDonald's, your nearest Walmart, all of that stuff is 20 hours that way. So imagine that it's summertime out here on the Pingos, and out there you've got whales swimming by in the ocean. Over there you've got thousands of caribou, or as they're known here in Anubia Lectin, Tuktu. Can everybody try and say that? Tuktu. One more time, Tuktu. All right, awesome guys. 
We said it, now you guys know another Inuvia Lucton word. So why are these important? Caribou and whales are what people survived on. This is what they ate, but they also ate berries, fish, and other wildlife that you can find right here at the Pingos. So here you've got thousands of berries. You've got different cranberries and blueberries and ookpicks. You've also got different fish like losh, whitefish, jackfish, and you've also got a ton of different birds like sandhill cranes, tundra swans, and geese. All of these things are so important. So, other than that, why are the pingos so important for this area? Well, we protect them because there are just so many out here. Right here in the Tuktoyaktuk Peninsula, we have more pingos than anywhere else in the world. There's 1,350 in total right here in this area. And why are pingos so special and so different? because they don't look like they should be here, right? So you've got all of this flat land, all of the tundra, and then these pingos jutting out of the land, about 30 meters each. They're huge, and that's why you stand here and can see for miles. So, what are pingos? What makes them different from just a regular hill that you would find anywhere else in Canada? Pingos are made of ice instead of made from soil, or land like a mountain or a hill anywhere else in Canada and they're found all over the polar region in the world but here right here right where we're standing has more of them than anywhere else and that's why Parks Canada protects them alongside their Inuvialuit partners. Pingos themselves these ice cored hills grow for, for about a thousand years and they grow and they grow up and then they sit here for a while and they stabilize until they collapse in the end. They're super important. So how important are the pingos? Well, the pingos are so important that the Inuvialuit actually decided to put it into their land claim agreement. So the Inuvialuit final agreement, which was written in 1984, covers the entire Inuvialuit settlement region in the Western Arctic. And the pingos are actually written into that so that we, as Parks Canada, legally protect it from here until the end of time. All right, it's getting a little bit cold up here on top of the pingos. So, to learn more about how we protect them and what we do to manage the pingos, let's go back to studio. Ready? Let's go. All right, so welcome back inside. Now you know a little bit more about what a pingo is and some of the reasons that they're important. And you've even been on top of one virtually. So how many people can actually say that? Probably not that many. So what Parks Canada is doing, along with the help of Natural Resources Canada, is monitoring them to see if they're changing at all because of climate change. So all along the Arctic coast, the shore is washing away or eroding putting all of that material, all of that mud, grasses, berries, plants, and all of these things that have been frozen in the permafrost for thousands of years into the ocean. So we're using cameras and these guys, if anyone knows what this is, to monitor and do this monitoring. So this is a UAV or a drone as most people call it. Uh, we can use it to fly over and take measurements of the pingos and the coast and see how they're changing over time. So you can see on the front of this UAV that there's a camera here. And if we fly over it year after year, we can actually see how much things have changed every year. So that's one of the ways that we can do it uh, with that 4K camera. So if you guys wanna check out some of these pictures here, so we'll show our first picture. Uh, we took these last summer, so you can just see how much of this land is actually falling away into the sea. You can see on the bottom corner of that picture, there's two little colorful dots, and those are actually full-grown people. And that is just to show you how big this land actually is and how much is washing away. So if we go on to the second picture, and you can see that there's about a meter of coastline in this area alone in Tuktoyaktuk that's washing away. 
But in other parks that we monitor here in the Western Arctic, like Ivovik, we're actually losing up to nine meters in some spots. But in this picture here, you can see the cross section of what permafrost looks like. So you can see the top layer there above that icy layer is called the active layer of soil. So that'll freeze and thaw every year. And that's where all of the vegetation grows. So all of the grasses, all of the willows, all of the berries, all that kind of stuff will grow in that active layer. And then you can see underneath it, that frozen layer beneath it. And that frozen layer in Tuktoyaktuk goes down about 500 meters. But as the sun beats down on it in the summer and the waves come in and crash against it in the summer, we're losing that due to this erosion. So if we go to the next picture, so we monitor it from above and we fly these UAVs so that we can get these dramatic pictures and show what these things look like. If we go on to the next picture, we're not only using drones, we're actually using these remote cameras to see what things are looking like as well. So these remote cameras actually take pictures at the same time every day. So if you take pictures at the same time every day, you can just see the daily change. And in the middle of the summer, this erosion is happening so fast that we can see that. So if we come back to me here, oh, what's the next picture? So to do these pictures, so if we come back to me, this is what one of the remote cameras looks like. So this one is one of ours, so not one of Natural Resource Canada's. And it can take that picture. We can also set it to take pictures of wildlife. And we do that some in some of our other parks. So we go back to the pictures. One of the ways that we have to get out to do these kind of things, to check our cameras, to fly the drones, is we have to actually helicopter out to these sites because they're so remote. Which gives us a way better view of what's going on. Because then we can see for ourselves what's happening from the air. So if we get rid of the picture there and come back to me, uh, while we're doing all of this work, we need to remember that we are sharing this land not only with the people, but with the animals that like to den here, like the Arctic fox. So I've got an Arctic fox fur here, so you can just see how well this guy blends in with the, with the landscape. You can just see how white he is. He's a little bit shorter than your red fox, and he's just really well adapted. But we also need to make sure of our safety because not only do we have animals like that, but we have animals that would want to eat that as well and then also would hunt on people. So we need to make sure that we carry our bear spray with us because we also have polar bears. And this is a real polar bear skull. And this is actually a small one. So you can just see his fangs here. You can see how big that is compared to my finger. So I really would not want to tangle with this guy in the wild. We also need to be very, very conscious about where we're stepping and what we're seeing while we are out there. So we need to make sure that we don't step on these guys. So we'll bring up the next picture. And that is an ook pick or a cloud berry. These berries are so important for the people and the animals that live here. They provide vitamin C, Everyone goes berry picking in the summer and it's a staple part of the diet of the Inuvialuit people that live here. If we go on to the next picture, we also have cranberries. And cranberries are another staple for the people that live here. And they also provide food for the animals like the birds and everything else that lives there, which then provides up the food chain. So it's super important. These things are what makes this area super biodiverse. So now we'll come back to me. And finally, we are going to talk about the last reason that the pingos are super important for a new Vialuit culture. So we've talked about them being used as a look off for people um, to see what's going on in the ocean, on the tundra. But for this part, for the new Vialuit culture, I'm gonna have to ask you guys to use your imagination. So first, we're gonna have to travel back about 200 years ago. So before Europeans came to this space, and you are an Inuvialuit hunter, 
floating off the coast in your kayak. So we've got some beautiful ocean noises there. If you guys want, you can close your eyes and just imagine that you're in the ocean, in your kayak, you're an Anubi Alouette hunter, but you've lost your friends. Remember, it's 200 years ago, there's no GPS, there's no cell phones, all you have is your knowledge of the land and the water. What you should be thinking about now and, tr and trying to get back home is how you got out here, how you got lost. So where should you be going back? So you know that the wind was in your face when you were paddling out. So you know that it has to be at your back when you're paddling in. So you're going to have to turn around. So everybody imagine that you're in your kayaks. So hold your paddles. I don't know if you guys have ever kayaked before, but if you hold your paddles out, hold them up and we're going to try and paddle and we're going to hold and we're going to paddle to the right so we can turn this boat around. So in three, two, one, we're going to paddle to the right. So paddle down, paddle down, paddle down, and we should be turned around now. So now that the wind is at our back, we are going to have to try and paddle back in. So we're going to try and paddle hard. So you have to paddle left and right in the kayak, right? So let's start paddling and let's start paddling hard. So in three, two, one, we'll paddle, but make sure you're keeping an eye out for anything that looks familiar because you don't have your friends. It is super dangerous to be out here alone. You never know what's going to happen in the ocean. So three, two, one, we start paddling. So right, left, right, left, right, left. And now you're kind of looking out on the landscape. You don't see anything yet, but you do see a white fish swimming around. So we're going to keep on paddling. You kind of can see the bottom. All right, so we're going to keep going. So one, two, three, four, we're paddling. So make sure to keep an eye out for anything familiar. Can you guys see anything in the landscape? You see a green tip. What is it? Well, let's start paddling back towards that and we'll try and find out. So we paddle a little bit more. So one, two, three, four. And you notice that it is a pingo. You found your way back. You've made your way back to dry land. Your kayak adventure is over and we are back in our classroom. So, I hope you've had an adventure today. Make sure that if you are ever kayaking, bring your GPS, bring your friends, because you don't want to get lost. You guys probably don't have pingos where you are to try and find your way back. So, would I hope, I hope you had fun on your adventure today. And just remember, be safe out there. There are bears. We need to watch out for them when we're doing our work. They're... Could be things in the ocean if you're kayaking, bring your life jackets. Now we can open it up for a few questions. Well, thank you so, so much, Kyle. That was awesome. You're such a great sport man to canoe inside the office. I really appreciate that. And I need one of those ocean wave generator noise thingy because that is very soothing. So thank you so much for a, a cool presentation today. Our, our YouTube audience was uh, very quick to point out and, and relentless in pointing out that the video had a bit of an issue today. That is half the fun of video broadcast. Something must go a little bit wrong, but what we're gonna do is make sure that all our groups that registered have a chance to see that video so you can match up Kyle's voice to his actual movements through the landscape and we can all see that together. So if you guys didn't catch the video, you want to see that, don't worry. We'll make sure that you guys have that opportunity. Uh, Kyle, yeah, we're going to dive in with questions. We've got a whole bunch, over 330 people and groups watching on YouTube right now. So if you're on YouTube and you're a classroom teacher, firstly, let me know where you're joining from. We'd love to get a sense of our audience today. And then you can begin sharing questions in the chat. We've also got our six live groups with us, so it's really exciting. I'll come to you guys in just a minute live so you guys can percolate your questions. And I'll start with one from Miss Wilton's class at St. Patrick's School. So they're on YouTube and they want to know, um, is the fur real? We get this a lot when people bring in animal artifacts. So can you tell us about the fur and the skull and what's going on? <laughs> so both of these things that I showed you today, both the Arctic fox and the polar bear skull are both real. Uh, so you can actually see his, uh, unfortunately, his little face here and uh, his legs underneath. So one of the unique things about an Arctic fox is that their legs are really, really short. And their bodies are actually really, really round. 
And that actually helps them here on the tundra because it helps them conserve body heat. Uh, a little bit different than your, than your regular red fox. But he's still got the really, really fluffy tail. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. We, we did this in Kushi Walk too, is that there are animal skulls, furs, things like that, but they're really useful as teaching tools. And I don't know for any of our students, it's been a long time since we've had the chance to maybe hold one of these in person, maybe at a zoo or a Parks Canada site, uh, but they're really, really special. It's, I think a, a, a fantastic opportunity to connect with wildlife, to actually get to hold a fur, to feel a skull, to see what the sort of the animal's like and it's, it's in the wild. Um, fantastic, guys. Great first question. And thank you for all the questions coming in on YouTube as well. I'm going to go to Miss Kitchen. Uh, she can kick us off with a question with one of her students uh, joining at home. So, Miss Kitchen, welcome in and take us away. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I I have a couple questions just to start off. Um, when we were looking at the shoreline and we saw the permafrost, um, question is: Is it washing away? Uh, because it is defrosting or the ocean rising or both? So that's question it's actually a little bit of both. Uh, so the ocean is, of course, we're getting stronger storm surges uh, because there's less ice in the ocean every summer. Uh, so that's actually really combating that. So the storm surges are coming in and they're washing away a little bit more. But it's also thawing because as soon as you expose that permafrost to the sun, the sun beats down on it 24 hours a day for about 60 days up in Tuktoyaktuk. -tuk -tuk. So if you have 60 days of sunlight continually beating down on this surface, it's going to be thawing a little bit more. So the more that that storm surge hits it, the more it gets exposed, and then the more it melts away, thaws away. Fantastic. Thanks, Ms. Kitchen, for that first question. Uh, let's head now to Ms. Buckland's class. If you guys want to come on in for a question, go for it. Hi, Hi there. I had a question from one of my students. We're joining from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, one of my questions from my students was, are pingos in other very cold places like Antarctica, the South, the North Pole? So pingos actually happen all around the polar region. So yeah, so the Antarctic region and the Arctic region, uh, we like to boast because we have the most pingos of anywhere in the world or the highest concentration within this area. And that's why they're so special in this area. Um, we actually have the second tallest pingo in the world within this area. It's called Ibyuk. It's 49 meters tall. It's only about three meters shorter than the tallest one, which is actually in Alaska. Maybe it'll grow and we'll get a little more national pride. We'll just, like just surpass them, like a CN Tower type thing. Um, awesome, guys. Miss Robbins class, come on in. Uh, I know your text's been a little iffy in the background, but hopefully you're good to go. Come on in for a question with us if you can. Yeah, my tech is being a little iffy and no camera. Um, my one student was wondering how many polar bear skulls you have found in the area. Yeah. So how many polar bear skulls we found in the area? Uh, so we don't actually find the skulls. Uh, people here hunt polar bears to sustain their families, and that is part of their way of life. Uh, so these polar bears uh, skulls that we have here at Parks Canada usually get donated to us from those hunters. That's fascinating. It's so interesting having done a lot of polar bear programs in the past to hear about that because of course when most people think about polar bears they think about protecting at all costs and I think one of the the great stories that Parks Canada can tell and that indigenous communities in the north can tell is that of subsistence hunting. It's one that we could probably do an entire whole broadcast on but I'm really really happy you mentioned that today and, and hopefully our, our classes take the chance to look into that learn a little bit more. We'll of course be linking more on the Pingo National Landmark at the end of the broadcast so uh, perhaps there's some information there that our classes can check out so thank you for that Kyle. Um, I'm going to take a quick question from YouTube before we go back to our live class. So Ms. Smith and Donnan, I uh, will come to you guys in a second. But I love this question from Catherine Daunt. Um, a student would like to know the difference between a canoe and a kayak. I'm, your, your demonstration inspired this question, Kyle. <laughs> All right. So a canoe is uh, generally an open boat. Uh, and you basically you paddle it because you've got a paddle that you paddle like this. Whereas a kayak has a two bladed paddle and you sit in the middle and it's open and it's got a, I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically a hole in the middle of the boat and you paddle on both sides. Yeah. 
If you, uh, I, I really hope all our students, certainly Canadian students, uh, it's sort of a, a essential element of Canadian identity to canoe, to kayak, to be out on water bodies, whether that's big lakes or, or you know, rivers uh, all across Canada on the oceans. So I hope uh, for our students that may never have had a chance to actually get in a canoe or kayak that you do get that opportunity over the summer coming up, maybe the fall. Uh, it's a really, really impactful experience and one that's very special to me personally as well. So great question, you guys. All right, Miss Smith's class, let's unmute that mic. Come on in. Oh, we've got two devices on Miss Smith, uh, which means you'll get a bit of an echo if you keep that second one on. So I'll head to Dawn in school right now and I'll come back to Miss Smith in a minute. Dawn and guys, just unmute your microphone. Welcome into the full class. So nice to have a full class. Oh, oh, the best. Hi, guys. <laughs> I have a question. Chase, ask the question. Do polar bears have any natural enemies? Any natural en enemies? Oh, that's a that's a good one. So polar bears are pretty much the top predator uh, along the uh, in the Arctic, but of course we as humans do hunt them. Uh, as I was saying earlier, for subsistence. So natural enemies, other than humans, probably probably not. Yeah. yeah. No rogue uh, cranberry attacks on polar bears or anything like that. I, I've, we always get apex predator questions, so I appreciate that. So thank you guys in our Donut School. So nice to have a the top of the food chain. Yeah, it's uh, one of the apex predators on the entire planet. This is the largest land carnivore, is it not? I think so, polar bears? Planet? It is. Uh, okay. Lucky us to have such a cool thing here. Um, okay. Question, guys. Miss Smith, again, you guys have two devices on, so you will have a problem if you try and come in with that. Do turn off one of those devices, and I'll be able to come to you in just a minute. Uh, but Kyle, I'll share a question from YouTube for us. Miss Donald's class joining us in Petrolia, Ontario. I think we've had every class in Petrolia, Ontario over the last few years. They've got a whole bunch about erosion. So I'll bring it up. Uh, how much land gets eroded every year? How long does it take for a pingo to get to its full form? And epically, what does it look like when a pingo collapses? Ooh, great, great questions. So how much land erodes every year? It depends on where you are on the coast. So it depends on what the soil's like. Um, and some, some of it will actually erode and then kind of flow over to a different spot and build it up a little bit. But as I said, in Ivavik National Park, another park that we work with up here, uh, we're doing a lot of studies along the coast and we're losing in places up to nine meters a year. Oh. In the Tektayuktak region where the pingos are, on average, it's about a meter a year, uh, according to my Natural Resource Canada friends who are, who are working in that area. Oh. Um, next question was, Oh, I'll bring that back up for how you. Long you the, how long does the pingo take to grow? It's about yeah. a thousand years. Uh, so they continue growing for about that amount of time. And what does it look like when they collapse? Well, they just kind of collapse and then it's almost like a lake, but you can kind of see a little hump thing. Yeah, it's just... It's not an epic supernova explosion of, of tundra in every direction? No, no, it's not. But the actual really cool part about a pingo is that because it's an ice cored hill, yeah. What happens is while it's growing, there's actually liquid water in the center of it still. Cool. So what they found in the past when they were trying to figure out how old these things were is they would drill down yeah. into the center of them just to try and get an ice core sample. And sometimes if they did that and there was water in the center still, it would gush up like an oil gusher because there's so much pressure built up in the middle of these things. How cool is that? I love that. Thanks, Kyle. All right, guys, we're going to go back to our live classes for another round of questions. We'll take a few more from YouTube. We are whipping through these. So thank you guys for these awesome questions. Um, Miss Kitchen, if you want to come back in and take us away, go for it. Uh, sure. Am I allowed to ask more than one or just one? You can ask more than one. Be a rebel. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a rebel. Okay. All right. Um, questions. Uh, what year did Pingo start um, being studied? When did that study start? And um, what kind of animals live in the area that you'd find pingos? Yeah. That's a good start. We would want to uh, open nice. <laughs> What year did pingos start getting studied? Uh, I can't give you a specific date. I don't actually know off the top of my head, uh, but I can reach out to you afterwards. Uh, it, and, and give you a specific date. I'm pretty sure it was in the 70s, um, but I, I don't know for certain. And what kind of animals call this place home? Yeah, if, if you want to look that up. Yeah, my, uh, my colleague here is just going to look it up. Um, what kind of animals make this place home? Well, we have tons of aquatic species. 
Uh, so I've seen beluga whales there. Uh, I've seen lots of fish there, some uh, sandhill cranes, geese, tundra swans. Uh, of course, we've got caribou out there. Uh, we've got grizzly bears. We've got polar bears, uh, Arctic foxes, lots of uh, lemmings and other small small mammals as well. Uh, so lots of animals. It's a very, very diverse place. And it's such an important message to share. I think certainly when I was a kid, if I thought about the Arctic, I sort of thought of this barren wasteland of just ice and, and perpetual darkness. And on the contrary, in our programs in the past, we found people talking about you know, these amazing, like endless fields of wildflowers and berries and all these uh, amazing wildlife. Some of the great migratory herds on this planet are caribou in Canada's north. And, you know, we talked about apex predators with polar bears earlier. I think that's such a special and important thing for kids across Canada and around the world to know that it's such a rich and amazing ecosystem and the home to so many amazing peoples. So uh, I think we've done a really exciting job of sharing that story today. So thank you so much for that, Kyle. Um, Miss Buckland's class, come on back in, uh, take us away and ask away. <laughs> so my student had a two-part question. How do animals depend on pingos and do plants also depend on them? So not the pingos themselves, uh, because it is just a part of the landscape, but uh, the area that we protect that has the pingos in it is a super diverse area. So the animals depend on all the berries and other uh, animals that they prey on. Uh, and some animals will actually den at the base of the pingos. They provide a little bit of shelter from the elements. Uh, so in the winter here, we get some crazy, crazy storms coming through. Uh, especially off the coast. So what happens is, is if the wind comes, you get a bit of a wind block from that pingo. It provides a little bit of shelter for those small animals. Uh, and then what, uh, what was the second part of that question? Sorry. Let me bring her back in. Sorry, Miss Buckland, come on back in. Sorry. It was also do plants depend on pingos? Yeah. So not so much the actual pingos themselves. Uh, but again, there are a lot of different plants that just rely on that uh, freeze thaw of that of that active layer, uh, which is part of a permafrost structure, which is also what the uh, what the pingos are. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Miss Buckland. All right, we're gonna go to Miss Robbins and then Dawn in school. Dawn in school, you guys shared a really cool question in the chat bar, but save it for live. It's more fun to share it on camera. I'm uh, Miss Robbins. If that text still working, let's come back and find yeah. it better. Uh, so my class is asking, what happens to the Arctic wildlife if the land keeps eroding and washing away? Great question. Yeah, so the the wildlife is actually going to just move in a little bit further. So they're not going to notice as much of the coastal erosion and things going away. Uh, but what it does affect is the people that live here. So in the community of Tuktoyaktak, they've actually already had to move a few houses uh, because the erosion has actually moved in close enough that their houses would have been lost into the sea. So th this is an excellent segue into this question that we got uh, from YouTube. So Ms. Monk's class, they want to know, what do the homes look like in this area? I know we didn't have a picture of one in the actual broadcast, but give a sense. Is it like a, a standard brick house that we'd have here? Is it a little bit different? What are people living in? So because there's permafrost, something that's completely different than anywhere else that I've ever lived in, is all of the houses here are actually on stilts or on blocks. So you can't really have a basement here. Yeah. Um, so all of the houses here are constructed pretty normal way, standard two by four construction, uh, but they're all built up on blocks. And that means that as the permafrost thaws and stuff every year, I know my house uh, actually kind of shifts every year depending on how things are thawing. So it's a little bit different, but the houses are all kind of the same as you would have in the south. Yeah, I really do encourage our, our classes when you're done this broadcast, look up Arctic communities, whether it's Inuvik, Tuktoyuktuk. I mean, Canada is, is rich in amazing places up in the north above the Arctic Circle. Check out those communities. They're some of the most beautiful looking places in the entire planet. I've always been really entranced by them. So I hope you guys get the chance to check that out and are as well. Um, we got a question from Mr. LeBrun's class in Southern Ontario, a question I was really hoping for. You started your broadcast by talking about this blizzard. So they want to know. Tell us more about the weather and the blizzard. How long do you expect winter to keep going and how much snow are you guys gonna get today? <laughs> well, we're not gonna get that much snow. Uh, I think it's about two to four centimeters is what they're forecasting, but it's the wind that's going to be coming. Uh, tonight, we're actually looking at wind gusts of up to 65 kilometers an hour. 
Um, but the weird thing is, is that the last three days here, it has been almost like summer. Uh, I was sitting out on my deck in the sun yesterday up until 10 p.m. La last night. Uh, but then the weather can just shift so quickly here, just depending on where the wind is coming from. So it is blizzarding. It's snowing pretty good out there right now. Uh, but we won't actually get that much snow because the Arctic is technically a desert. We don't get that much precipitation. But the pre precipitation that we do get in the winter, the snow, just stays around for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, I can't say for certain how long the winter is going to last. Uh, one day it could be beautiful summer and the next it could be winter. Doesn't matter if it's June, August, May, all the same. It's just the way it is, the way the wind's blowing. I'm so glad we got a weather question in there. Actually, a quick follow-up on that, and then we'll go to our dawn in school in just a second, uh, about night and daylight in the Arctic. So where you are, really, really high up north of the Pingos, what is the situation like? What are the How long are the days? And do you have perpetual darkness? Do you have perpetual sunlight? What's the situation? Yeah, so I don't live in Tartayaktak. Uh, I live in Inuvik. Uh, and in Inuvik, in the winter, we get 31 days where the sun doesn't come up over the horizon. Wow. But we do celebrate the, the sun coming back with a huge festival here in Anubik with a big bonfire and fireworks. And really it's the only time of year that we can, we can let fireworks off here because in the summer we actually have 56 days that the sun is up completely. So 56 days, the sun doesn't set. Uh, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. You could be out at four in the morning and be in perfect daylight. <laughs> right now the sun's going down about midnight-ish, but it doesn't actually get dark now because the sun's coming up uh, early enough that it's kind of just like twilight. Cool. I'm so glad we got a chance to cover that. Um, I'm going to go to Dawn in School and then Miss Smith, you got everything working tech-wise. That's awesome. Uh, so we'll come to you next. Dawn in School, just unmute that mic. Welcome back in, kids. Hi. I know. Me in class is the best. Come on up. Go for it. <laughs> you want to ask it? Pingos have layers like trees. Pingos have layers. Layers like trees. Oh, so layers like trees. So what people do to try and figure out what's happened in the past for climate is they take ice cores, kind of like a tree core, but they don't actually do that directly from the pingos. They'll usually do that into glaciers. Um, the layers of the pingo will kind of build out and then you have your active layer like I was talking about with the soil and that actually kind of holds everything in place and then it's all ice in the middle. So it's a little different than like a tree layer kind of thing to try and figure out the age. I, I love the question though. I love where your head's at guys. One of the cool things about tree layers is that it's based on the fact that they have a growing season. So they live and they grow in a certain season, then they stop growing. And so you end up with that ring structure that we see inside tree cores. Coral reefs have something very, very similar. So you can age coral reefs based in that sort of way as well, because they're alive, uh, unlike pingos. So very cool question, guys. All right, Miss Smith, if this works, fingers crossed, come on in and share a question. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we're all set. Okay, so one of the students wanted to know, and we hope this hasn't been asked yet. We, as you know, we've been having technical difficulties, but how tall is a pingo? Yeah. Yeah, so pingos, uh, as I said, we have the second highest pingo in the world here, and it's 49 meters tall. Yeah. So it is very tall. Uh, so when you're on the flat tundra landscape, you can see everything from up top it, of it. Uh, we were on the second largest pingo that we have in the area when we did our video, and you could see for miles. Um, as I said, the tallest pingo in the world is in Alaska, and it is about 53 meters tall. Uh, so it's just a bit taller than, than Ibiak over in Tukta Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Ms. Smith, for getting in, and I'm, I'm glad you made it all work. Uh, we're going to take two more questions. So one that I've gotten a few times on YouTube and in the chat bars, how did pingos get their name? What's the, where does that name originate from? So pingo actually means hill in Anuvia Lupton. <laughs> that's a, that's a, good, a good descriptor. Um, Kyle, our, our biggest question that we've gotten on YouTube, and one that I was very much expecting we get a lot of today, is about climate change. How is climate change affecting the pingos? I know you've talked about this a little bit, about where, like, what's the future hold for this landscape and for this amazing place? So the two main pingos that I showed you are pretty far away from the coast, uh, and as long as they don't get their cores exposed, 
they shouldn't be that affected yet. Uh, however, we are seeing some pingos right along the coast that have been almost sheared in half just by the storm, storm surge and the coastal erosion that's happening. Uh, so yeah, things are things are happening with climate change up here. Uh, we're definitely seeing a lot uh, bigger variations than you do in the south up here in the north. I like to talk to elders a lot uh, at festivals and in the winter time. Uh, and when it's about minus five degrees at the sunrise festival that I was telling you about when we welcome back the sun, a lot of the elders that have been around for uh, a really long time up here say that it should be around minus 60. So there's a lot of variation um, about uh, how how much it's changed here. Um, and, and yeah, climate change is definitely affecting us up here. Yeah. I'm really, really glad you took the chance to highlight sort of this, this elder long-standing knowledge and oral history tradition. One of the things that we've covered a lot in our broadcast in the past is this sort of two-eyed seeing way of looking at the world. And so you're the first to mention in one of our cross Canada virtual field trips, this idea that, you know, Western science can collaborate with indigenous knowledge to understand more about the ecosystem and how it's changed over time. So it's a distressing thing to think how much it's changed in, in just a short time. And one thing that I think is important about climate change to highlight for our kids today is that you guys can ask your parents, you can ask your teachers, even in my lifetime, I'm 29 years old and the, the climate here in Toronto where I am has changed quite radically in the last 20 years where summers and winters are different than they used to be. So it's not something that's happening in some far off future. It's something that's happening right now. So I think that that is a scary thing, but it's also a means to sort of get that knowledge directly from the people in your lives. So I really appreciate you sharing that, Kyle. And uh, this Sunrise Festival sounds amazing, by the way. I want to look up videos and pictures of this because that sounds like the coolest thing ever. Imagine, you know, a month without sun and then suddenly it crests the horizon. You get to have the biggest party of all time. Uh, you're a very lucky person to be in that uh, place to have that sort of situation. Uh, Kyle, before we wrap up in a minute, I just want to share a few things for our audience today. If you guys are keen to learn more, take part more in this Cross Canada virtual field trip, again, head to the exploringbythesea.com slash Cross Canada virtual road trip uh, to find out our whole slate of programs. If you go to our YouTube channel as well, you will see all our past programs in playlists in English and in French. And of course, if you want to find out more about this partnership and the amazing organizations that are bringing this virtual field trip into fruition, uh, check out pc.gc.ca, the Parks Canada site, for all about their national landmarks, historic sites, and more. You can check out rcgs.org for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and us at exploringbytheseat.com. Finally, if if you want to learn more about the Pingo Historic Landmark by itself or National Landmark by itself, check out this website. I'll leave that up for a little bit, kind of an unwieldy URL, and I'll put all of these in the chat in the next few minutes as well. Kyle, before we wrap up and, and give our, our teachers a chance to say a big thank you and goodbye, is there any last message you'd like to share about your experiences up there or, or anything we want to leave kids with about Pingos? So the only other thing that I really wanted to say to you guys was thank you or koyanani. Um, it has been a pleasure doing this today and just telling you guys about a little bit about what's happening up here. Uh, I'm, as you can tell, I'm probably not originally from here, um, but living up in this area has been totally eye-opening for me. Uh, and it's been a wonderful experience and I would recommend that everyone has that experience and comes up to, to check us out and drive that new road all the way up to the Arctic Ocean and see the pingos for yourselves. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Kyle. Uh, what a fantastic program. The YouTube comments are amazing in the chat. Everyone really, really appreciated the chance to hear from you today. Tomorrow, we continue our tour in English as well at Gross Eel in Quebec. So I hope uh, our audience today gets a chance to come and join us for that as well. And Kyle, I know it's your first time joining us, but what we do to wrap up every single broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our live groups to say a big thank you and goodbye with me. So Miss Kitchen, Miss Buckland, Miss Robbins, and Miss Smith, if you guys